hello, and welcome to the Slate Political Gab Fest. February 23rd, 2023, the What Tucker Carlson is Saying When You're Not Listening edition. I am David Plotz of CityCast. I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm joined by Emily Bazelon of the New York Times Magazine and Yale University Law School from New Haven. Hello, Emily. Hey, David. And John Dickerson of CBS Prime Time from New York City. Hello, John. Hello, David. Hello, everybody out there. Hello, everyone out there in TV land. This week on the GabFest, Biden goes to Ukraine to buttress that nation on the first anniversary of the Russian invasion. We will talk to Anne Applebaum of The Atlantic about where the war is and where it's going. Then a lawsuit against Fox has revealed that its hosts and executives knew that Trump's election claims were bogus, yet promoted them anyway. Is that significant? Then the Supreme Court hears a challenge to Section 230 which protects huge tech platforms from liability when their users post defamatory or dangerous content. Uh, could Section 230 be getting 86th to use two numbers together? Plus, of course, we'll have cocktail chatter. This week marks the one-year anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. President Biden made a surprise visit to Ukraine and gave a speech indicating his administration's unwavering support for that country. Vice President Harris declared that Russia had committed war crimes during the war. Meanwhile, Vladimir Putin celebrated the progress of the war with speeches and public celebrations of this terrible war. And behind all this, of course, a continuing brutal trench and artillery war is being waged across a 600-mile front. We are joined by Anne Applebaum of The Atlantic, who's been studying and writing about the Russian war against Ukraine since before it started. So, Anne, is it any clearer how this war can end than it was last time we talked to you six months ago? So it's clear to me how the war has to end, but it's not clear yet how we get there, um, because the ending of the war will depend on what happens on the ground. Um, and I know this is a hard concept to, to for everybody to, to, to get used to, but essentially the war will end when Russia understands that the war was a mistake. So um, when Russia goes through the same process that France went through with Algeria or the British went through with Ireland at the beginning of the 20th century, when they understand that this is not part of their country and that they can't win the war. Um, and that understanding could happen tomorrow, or it could happen next week, or it could happen next year. And it is most likely to happen following a series of Ukrainian victories. So when Ukraine begins to take back more of the territory that it lost since last February, since a year ago, um, possibly when it begins at least to challenge or at least to cut off or threaten the stability of Crimea, that's when there will be a, a moment of crisis in Moscow. There are a lot of things we know about Russia that don't lead us to any real conclusions. We know that there's a lot of discontent in the upper levels of Russian society. Uh, the speech that Putin gave um, on the same day that, of Biden's speech a couple of days ago um, was very pointed. It was very much directed at the people in the room. And there was a comment about, we will hunt down traitors Nobody will be allowed to betray our cause. I mean, that was meant for the business people and security officials and bureaucrats who were there. Um, so we know there's discontent and we know there's beginning to be questioning of what has happened, but it can't tell you how that process will play itself out. A few weeks ago, it seemed like Russia was going on the offensive and there was fear that Ukraine would be set back. Um, has that actually happened or has that offensive actually gone quite badly for Russia in other words, you're talking about Ukraine needing to produce some victories. And kind of where are we in the military picture? So in the military picture, you know, the Russia is, you know, there is a Russian offensive going on. It's concentrated in the northern part of the country. You've probably heard the name of this town, Bakhmut, which you probably never heard before and means nothing to you and actually doesn't mean that much to anybody even over there. So it's a surprising target for tens of thousands of people to die for. Um, so from what we know, the way the Russians have been fighting up there is literally throwing waves of soldiers at the front line. So think World War I, telling the soldiers to go over the top, carrying their rickety rifles. 
That's what's been happening. And it's a challenge for the Ukrainians because they have to, as one of them said to me in Munich last weekend, they have to have a bullet for every one of those soldiers. So they have to constantly be fighting back and it's very stressful and unpleasant and ugly. Um, but so far, there have been a few places where the Russians have moved forward by some hundred yards or even more than that, but there has been no major victory. And this is after weeks and weeks and weeks of fighting. So what it looks like right now is that the Russians aren't capable of anything more sophisticated than that. They've been willing to lose thousands of people and thousands of tanks, um, but they don't seem able to break through the Ukrainian front lines. And none of the American military people I spoke to think that they can. But there's a different question as to whether the Ukrainians can break through their lines. And the only way they'll be able to do that is by essentially changing the nature of the war. They'll have to do different kinds of operations, do something much more sophisticated, and it's my understanding that they are training to do that now, using much more innovative ways of fighting and um, much more high-tech ways of fighting. The feeling at the security conference about the state of things, the nature of support um, for Ukraine, and was there a consensus view, or just what was the feeling in the Bayerischerhof? The Bayerischer Hof, for those who don't know, is this luxury hotel where the Munich Security Conference takes place. And, you know, for 24 hours, well, 48 hours, really, every year, it becomes this scene of mass pressure and chaos as every single defense attache and defense minister and their bodyguards all stuff into this little tiny space. You know, you have this experience of seeing lots and lots of people that you know in a very, very short period of time, and you say hi across the room, and then they disappear. Um, and this year there was no consensus. Um, you know, what I just told you is what people say. So there is a consensus about the Russians can't move forward and we don't know yet whether the Ukrainians can. Um, there were a lot of Ukrainians there, one of whom said to me, you know, the Americans never think we can do anything until they see us do it. So they do seem very confident that they will win. I mean, you can take that can be bravado or that can be based on realism. I don't know. There remains a kind of, I suppose the most important schism is between the people who think um, sooner or later we will have to swap land for peace and reach some kind of frozen conflict thing, and people who think there will be some kind of paradigm shifting moment in the war. And there is a significant portion of the Republican Party here in the U.S., not yet a majority, but definitely a portion that is not really interested in further support for Ukraine. And Ron DeSantis, who is the arguably the front runner for the Republican presidential nomination in 2024, has, in, has in, sort of implied he thinks we should be out of the war. Doesn't isn't certainly isn't enthusiastic about supporting Ukraine much further. What's the? I don't know if you're a handicapper of American politics, but do, how much do Ukrainians worry, and how much are Europeans worried that American support could crumble if there's not a Biden presidency in 20? 25. So it's one of the reasons why the Ukrainians want to win the war this year <laughs> and not next year. I would say that, first of all. Second of all, I would say one of the things I was struck by in Munich, there's this huge congressional delegation that goes there. Dozens of congressmen go. Um, and I was in a room, I won't say who it was because it was off the record conversation, but there was a dinner for that where a lot of Ukrainians were in the room, including some soldiers and one who'd lost an arm. And there was a American congressman from a Southern state who got up and said, if they were invading my homeland, I would do exactly the same as you boys, you know, go Ukraine. So there's a, don't underestimate the strain in the Republican party that's pro the defense of Ukraine. In fact, when I heard him, I was like, oh, I'm so happy there's still Republicans like that. It was a great relief to hear him. Um, it's still an argument inside the party. And remember, it's my view that part of the opposition to the war is just opposition to Biden. And if the tables were turned, there was a Ron DeSantis presidency, would they withdraw and let the Ukrainians be crushed and then have that be an international scandal? You know, I don't think so. Some of this is just U.S. politics. But I do think it's a reason to try and win more quickly. The Ukrainians are aware that not everybody likes them. Um, not everybody supports them. They're aware of that in the U.S. and in Europe and elsewhere. Um, they do think about diplomacy a lot. They think about how to reach different American audiences, and they do talk to every Republican they can, as well as lots of Democrats. Um, they also talk to um, the big outreach to countries in Africa and Asia and Latin America, who they hope would be more vocally supportive than they have been, although I think they're realistic about that. I mean, I, I myself have started to wonder whether 
we can realistically expect, I don't know, Morocco or Angola to care a lot about the war and whether we should tear our hair out and feel bad that they don't. David mentioned when he was setting up the segment that uh, Vice President Harris was talking about crimes against humanity and the idea that there is evidence that Russia committed them, which, you know, in potentially theoretically could lead to charges in front of the International Criminal Court. Does this have any bearing on the actual conduct of the war? Does it strike fear into anyone's heart about the kinds of atrocities we've heard of? Probably not right now, although let me back up and say, first of all, Biden repeated that in Warsaw um, a couple of days ago, and Tony Blinken has said it as well. Harris spoke, by, by the way, very well and very emotively about that subject, partly because this is her background as a prosecutor. I have written about this recently. I wrote a piece in The Atlantic that was based on the reporting of a lot of Ukrainian journalists over the last several months. It's a piece about what actually happened in the occupied territories and what is happening now in those territories that are still occupied. Um, and it's important to understand what has happened. There has been, a, you know, an attempt to decapitate society, arrest mayors, arrest local councillors, um, arrest activists of any kind, change the way Ukrainian schools teach. Um, the Russians appear to have arrived without any clear idea of where they were and not expecting any resistance when they discovered that the people they were supposed to be liberating weren't Russians and they didn't welcome them. They became very violent. They're, you know, the acts of violence, they've discovered torture chambers, jails, um, people have disappeared. Thousands of children have been deported. I mean, thousands taken out of the country and sent to Russia away from their parents in what seems to be an attempt to replenish Russian genetic stocks. I mean, it's all very sick. Um, and so, you know, the U.S. can't really not talk about this. Um, I don't think we're yet at the stage where people have a clear plan about what to do about it. The Ukrainians are collecting evidence. In fact, this group of journalists I'm working with is part of that plan. I mean, lots of different groups are doing it. They're collecting evidence. They're compiling it. They're preparing for war crimes tribunals um, at some point down the road. And I think it's very important for the Ukrainians to believe that there will be some form of justice eventually. You know, one of the things that has struck a lot of people is just the way in which countries have the United States, Germany, Poland pivoted from what they were before the invasion. And how much of that is finding something deep within their culture? How much of it is pure opportunism? How much of it is just regional proximity? And and I wonder if there's anything fascinating to say about how Poland has responded and the role it's playing based on your deep knowledge of the country. Sure. Let me just say about China, I don't know. I can only speculate, but I also have the sense that not that many other people know either. Uh, I talked recently to a business friend of mine who's a very senior banker, and he has all these people who advise him about China. He says none of them know anything. The trip to Kiev was really important symbolically. It was, um, I think, probably for Biden personally to have done something like that and shown to go to a territory that had been a war zone that where there are no U.S. troops. It's not like visiting Afghanistan where, you know, the 101st Airborne takes care of your trip and facilitates everything, but to take the train uh, in the middle of the night, I think it was probably important for him. It was very important for the Ukrainians. They too read our papers and they read our arguments about whether it's worth sending them weapons and they um, it made them feel better at least about the next two years. Um, Poland has, at the moment the war broke out, there was a kind of galvanizing of society. So whereas the government up to the war had been a little bit ambivalent about Kiev. They didn't have close relations with the government. Um, the current ruling party is a far-right party that invited some of these pro-Putin other far-right parties to Warsaw in a few weeks before the war, even as the Americans were warning of the invasion. You know, they had Marine Le Pen in Warsaw, this French far-right leader who takes money from the Russians and so on. Um, so there was a little bit of government ambivalence, but there was this kind of social, I can't even describe it, like an overwhelming desire to help the Ukrainians. People drove their cars from Western Poland to the border to pick people up and take them home. I mean, literally everybody I know had Ukrainian refugees at one point staying in their house or in their garage or wherever it was they had space. We had them at different stages um, throughout the war as well. Everybody had them. When the Poles saw the invasion, they thought of 1939. You know, this is what it looked like when we were invaded. So nobody helped us. So we're going to help the Ukrainians. Anne Applebaum writes for The Atlantic. And thanks for joining us. Thank you. 
Hi, I'm Dahlia Lithwick, host of Slate's Amicus Podcast, and I'm here to tell you that we have a special offer on Slate memberships. You can now get three months of Slate Plus for just $15, and you'll get no ads on any Slate podcast, member-exclusive episodes and segments on my show Amicus, and shows like Political Gab Fest and Slow Burn, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. And best of all, you would be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism as we cover everything that is happening in the news every day. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcast plus. Again, that's three months for only $15. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus. Dominion Voting Systems sued Fox for defamation claiming that Fox's reckless promotion of crazy theories about Dominion after the 2020 election damaged the company to the tune of $1.6 billion. The lawsuit has gone into discovery because they didn't settle it. And that means everyone, they've been able to get depositions and also get access to lots of records. And this week, portions of a Dominion filing were made public. And that Dominion filing revealed internal Fox messages from executives and on-air personalities during the period after the election. To exactly no one's surprise, in private, people like Tucker Carlson and Sean Hannity were saying that Trump's claims about the election were preposterous and that his defenders like Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell were ridiculous and uncredible. But in public, of course, Fox was taking Powell and Giuliani's claims seriously and booking other guests who were spouting nonsense insane theories about Dominion. And uh, it was interesting. What were, was any of this surprising to you, Emily, what Fox people were caught saying in private? It wasn't surprising. I was surprised that they wrote it down and were so casual about it. I mean, I really love this phrasing from Tucker Carlson. Sidney Powell is lying, by the way. Just sort of by the way, this person who you're having on as a guest who's making these claims you know, effectively trying to represent uh, former President Trump in court. And then he says, it's insane. And Laura Ingram says back, Sydney is a complete nut. No one will work with her. Ditto with Rudy. So it's sort of exactly what you would imagine, because Laura Ingram and Tucker Carlson are smart people. You know, the juxtaposition of their casual facing of this reality and sharing it with each other. And then the fact that Fox continually were having on these guests and were clearly doing so in a bid to get back viewers who were angry with them because Fox called the election for President Biden relatively early in the night. I mean, to use the word hypocrisy is so to underplay it. It just feels like a complete betrayal of one's viewers in order to serve up the viewers exactly what Fox thinks they wanted. Although in Fox's model, which I think was proved by this discovery, it was not a betrayal of their viewers as they see it. Their job as they see it on both the business side and the opinion side is to give viewers exactly what they want, to give them only the mildest of of abrasions. Um, And maybe even a soft towelette is too harsh of an abrasion to give them. But the second thing, um, though, is that they felt pressure from, of all places, Newsmax. So, That's also extraordinary, which is Newsmax is a much stronger version of Fox. Fox may keep one or two of the old rules of journalism. Newsmax has pretty much thrown them by the wayside if they ever engaged with them. And I guess the distinction that surprised me a little more, although you've seen it happen, is the opinion side. You know Sean Andy, Laura Ingram, Tucker Carlson. This is not the first time in their lives that they have done this. So that isn't surprising that they were so blasé about playing with matches next to a spouting fountain of gasoline is something for people to put in their moral calculations about them. But for the business side and the editorial side to punish the journalists on the Fox kind of straight up journalism side for, for example, saying that Rudy Giuliani was spouting nonsense and lies or fact checking him or saying anything that was the truth out loud in the news portion of the show, for them to censure those journalists and to feel pressure and heat about saying things on the news side is a kind of level of corrosion that I guess if you'd forced me to come to a conclusion, I might have said it. But for it to be so thorough in the organization did surprise me a little bit. I'm about to say things which probably are ludicrous, but so it goes. So it goes. So these Fox personalities, So the t- I agree with you, John, that the punishing of the 
to one of the things that Fox did was it chastised and and censured and nearly had fired a, a reporter who publicly said that Rudy Giuliani's claims were were preposterous and and had factual evidence to say that his claims were preposterous and this person was punished in part because Tucker Carlson was saying it's damaging our stock price it's hurting us she needs to be fired so totally indefensible I won't defend that on the other hand have you ever met a journalist who doesn't say things in private differently than what they say in public who doesn't talk about their sources and the people they're writing about differently in private than they do in public who doesn't gloss over some of their you know uh it when they're writing in a way that they want their 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 sources to appreciate their work uh what no wait can i finish it (laughs) people constantly butter (laughs) the idea that they were saying one thing to to sydney powell and rudy giuliani in public and 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 uh, promoting their crazy conspiracy theories, and then in behind their backs, they were saying, "Oh, these guys are loony." That sounds like every journalist I've ever met who's always saying, "Oh, that person is just so full of shit." And I mean, come on, David, what are you saying? No, you can't finish. Go ahead. Uh, also, I would just add, let them lie and book them more often, so they can lie more and more and more. And nobody does that. I feel like lots of shows book people that they know to be speaking disingenuously all the time. Well, the, so that's a little closer. Now you're now I think the conflation is is a little closer to a, apples and apples. Um, right. And they shouldn't do that. And it's awful when they do. Secondly, to the extent they do, um, there is a standard which, you know, uh, regular journalists fall from all the time. But there is a standard that if you're going to invite somebody um, that you then push back and you don't let them just spew. You don't invite them on to spew. You invite them on because you think they have some influence in some certain quarters and you want to check that influence in real time. To the extent that that we don't, um, and this is the Donald Trump is the perfect case in this here, that's a failure. That's a huge failure. Um, and it's very, very bad. And I still don't think that's anything close to what Fox was doing, but it's closer than on the news side, which is, our whole job is to take sources and go, huh, they sound like they don't know what they're talking about. I better go talk to four other people and see if the person who's giving me the first piece of information is real. I mean, so full of shit is, I don't, I don't, I feel like you're conflating a bunch of things. Yes, for sure. Journalists bitch about sources. The idea that journalists say this person is lying about a matter of incredible national importance and I'm going to let them lie their head off on television, even though I know they're lying about whether the election was stolen. That does not seem like journalists in the course of business to me. I totally agree with everything you've just said. I guess I would ask you as a matter of law, Emily, do you feel that a news organization should be generally vulnerable to libel for claims made on matters of public controversy by controversial sources and guests. Like what, what is the standard by which when a news organization should be liable for that? Because presumably, you know, lots of times news organizations are inviting people on and these people are making claims that are, and sometimes we push back and sometimes we don't push back. In this case, clearly Fox was ginning it up, but it is really just they had guests on and the guests said crazy shit. So they should be liable for that? Give them a huge platform? Like, who are you talking about? Well, the th- I think that aren't they on the hook for not just booking them, but for booking them and knowing that they were lying and to continue keep doing that and more than just booking them, knowing that they're lying about a something of, of, of interest here. But then also themselves said things that made it seem like they're what these guests were saying were either true or could be true. And they knew them not to be true. So, I mean, it's also, I guess my point is, it's also specific things that the Fox host said on the air, um, which contradicted what they were saying in private. So I think they're on the hook kind of for two different things. Um, And by the way, no countervailing evidence. I mean, in other words, you might say, well, the mainstream news said a lot of things about Russia, you know, and influencing the campaign. Um, Again, the mainstream media did not do all of that knowing full well it was a lie. So that's not that's not the case, which is what the case is with Fox. But in, in other instances where the media has turned out not to be right, you had institutions like the FBI and the Justice Department and respected uh, people in positions of authority who could know saying this is the case. 
So that's a lot different than having a wing nuts who you know are lying, say a lie that you know is a lie and giving it more platform. But should Fox be liable because they book guests who have controversial theories about a matter of public interest? Well, I'm glad that you brought it back to the kind of legal heart of the case, because what we're talking about is whether Dominion voting systems was libeled and defamed on Fox, right? And so then you're in this relatively narrow sphere. You have to have a party that was specifically injured by the lies, and you have to be able to show that um, Fox either had actual knowledge that they were lying, hmm, seems like this discovery might be relevant to that, or that there was reckless indifference about whether they were lying. So the reason that we are in court with these claims of falsehood and knowingly putting on lying guests is that there is a company here that lost a ton of business, it claims, because of these lies. You have to have an injury. It has to be specific. It has to be personal. Courts have to be able to address it. We're not talking about general spewing of lies. And that's what distinguishes this particular situation and makes it actually unusual in terms of liability for this kind of falsehood. I'm not sure that I do want to protect Fox, I should note. I mean, some of this is just me sort of thinking out loud. I guess I'm super worried that there's a Supreme Court that it seems poised to to pull back the defenses that media has about incidents like this, episodes like this, where you are covering controversial matters and you're saying controversial things or booking controversial guests and the capacity of rich people and powerful people to really damage, not Foxes, but smaller media organizations. I know, for example, Mother Jones, the brilliant investigative magazine, has been beset over the years by extremely aggressive litigation from people who say that that controversial coverage in Mother Jones was libelous or defamatory and it's never it's never been found to be libelous or defamatory. They win all the time, but it but the the amount of effort that they and money they have to spend fighting this worries me. And so I just am like when I think about news organizations being on the hook for things that it's their sources say and for covering things that are extremely controversial and then being on the hook for covering things that are extremely controversial, it worries me. This may be the extreme case where a a news organization should be held liable, but I worry that this, good for the goose, good for the gander, that we will see a series of lawsuits, if this, a series of lawsuits against meeting organizations that I'm more sympathetic to than Fox, if this one goes through and is victorious. The Supreme Court this week heard arguments in two cases about whether tech platforms can be held responsible for things shared on them. In both cases, one which was uh, against YouTube slash Google, the other against Twitter, families of victims of terrorism allege that the platforms uh, didn't do the work they should do or did the work they should do badly in such a way that their... their, uh, a family member was was killed because of terrorism and that they should be held responsible. In one case, uh, I mean, it's so complicated. <laughs> it's so complicated. Um, I think we should really focus on the Google case because the Google case focuses on the most famous numerical section of the American law outside the amendments, section 230. The Twitter case is sort of a, it's like a side alley of this case. It's a different set of issues. But can we focus on the Section 230 case, Emily? Or you can take us where we want. So what 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 is Section 230? What do the plaintiffs in the Google case? One of the premises of all of this, though, Emily, isn't it, that YouTube and the other algorithms do do a lot of work trying to purge their sites of content that is sexual, exploitative, violent, inciting, inciting content. So it's not as though what what YouTube is recommending to people is look at this really fantastic act of terrorist violence. You should watch it. It's like they've tried to keep the acts of terrorist violence off of it. This is sort of the stuff that slips through that does 
meet their rules for acceptable content, right? So Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act of 1996 generally shields tech companies from liability from con- for sorry, generally shields tech companies from liability for content that their users publish, right? So this is the idea, and it came about in the 90s at the dawn of the internet, this question, okay, if you have like an AOL messaging board and someone defames someone else, should the messaging board have to bear the cost? And the courts at the time, well, Congress passed this statute, and then the courts very broadly interpreted it to basically allow the internet to grow and flourish and remove this threat of liability and to treat internet service providers like publishers. So the idea was you can go in and try to moderate your comments, and by doing that, you're not taking on the burden of being liable for something that slips in that's defamatory or violates some other law. And that was really important for allowing the internet to grow. There is a huge question about whether um, the internet now is like far beyond (laughs) this 1996 law and whether Congress should rewrite it. And that is one question. But Congress has not rewritten it. And so in the meantime, these lawsuits are being brought to try to kind of dial back the sort of immunity that um, Google and Twitter and Facebook, etc. have amassed to just sort of basically like change the power balance. And so in Gonzalez versus Google, you have the family of Nohemi Gonzalez, who was 23 years old. She was killed in the 2015 ISIS attack on um, in Paris. And this family's argument is that Section 230 should not stop this family from being able to sue, and that what YouTube was doing wrong here was recommending ISIS videos to its users through its algorithms. So to just Take this one more step. Um, Eric Schnapper, who is the lawyer representing the family, is saying in court, YouTube is not simply neutrally presenting this content. It's actually recommending that people go see more insightful pro-terrorist videos because of its algorithms. And the analogy that seemed to stick in court and I thought was useful was like the difference between a bookstore where you just put all the books out on the table You wouldn't be liable for the content of those books as the bookseller. But what if you make a catalog and you're highlighting certain titles? Aren't you the publisher of that catalog? Isn't that a step you've taken? Shouldn't you bear some consequences if you recommend ISIS content in that catalog? So that was one like old world way of thinking through um, at least part of the challenges here for the justices about um, how to think about this case. And it feels like it's even one step beyond the catalog because the catalog is being designed, bespoke designed to send to the terrorist curious. I mean, so it's not just a catalog for every person who walks in the bookstore. It's you go to the person in the terrorism section and say, hey, here's more terrorism. Um, and that, and And so what about, Emily, what's your view about the defense, which is essentially... YouTube is no different than a newspaper publisher, which chooses to put a variety of voices, makes a selection in putting a variety of voices on its op-ed pages um, that therefore is acting like a publisher and Section 230 uh, shields it from litigation under the Anti-Terrorism Act um, because it's acting like a publisher in that case. I mean, I think that's the core question and the big problem for the justices in court was how to draw the lines. The justices had a problem, which was that the lawyers on both sides were asking for really extreme things. The lawyer for the family was like, all these algorithms, bad. Like the Google search engine, bad. Like just mantle the entire internet as we know it. That freaked the justices out, like understandably. But the lawyer for Google was saying, In theory, we should be able to have a pro-ISIS algorithm that is specific for ISIS. We should be able to drive uh, users to ISIS deliberately because it should be totally up to us how to make any algorithm. And the justices, understandably, weren't too excited about that rule either. And it's just hard to figure out, I think, um, what to do about how you say that a particular set of recommendations is beyond the scope of 230. But then on the other hand, you know, for example, if Facebook wants to recommend um, private groups to people, is that 
uh, you know, also a problem or is that OK? And I think Justice Kagan was trying to present these different options. And she thought the lawyer for the family was going to say, oh, we're only talking about these algorithms in a particular situation. And instead, he said basically like, no, let's dismantle the whole Internet as we know it. And I this this case is um it has real problems as a vehicle for ruling. And so I wonder if they're going to send it back to the lower courts, which was what the United States government wanted, um, or figure out a way to use the other case, which we can talk about briefly, to just like sidestep the whole thing, because the other case has an off ramp in it. I think the government says a defendant could be liable under the Anti-Terrorism Act, even if it didn't know specifically about a specific terrorist act. So there can be generalized culpability. But then the government said the plaintiff has to allege more than um, be like that there's some line here between Twitter having to know about a very specific terrorist act um, and just generalized promotion of things. Um, I felt I thought the government kind of had it both ways that they don't support totally, but they also feel like Twitter could be on the hook in certain circumstances and not be shielded completely by 230. The litigation is trying to distinguish between taking stuff down versus still driving people to what you leave up, right? Like that conceptually seems relatively clear to me um, that even if YouTube is doing all this scrubbing, it could also be using its algorithms to drive people to the dangerous content that remains. But isn't the dangerous content that remains by the mere fact that it remains, it presumably is not, YouTube is determined it is not dangerous. I mean, maybe, but you're sort of assuming perfect scrubbing and that doesn't exist. So I'm not sure that you can really count on that. Like you can try to take a lot of bad stuff down, but it's really hard. There's a lot of bad stuff. I mean, it does seem like that wasn't YouTube's argument that actually our algorithm does treat all content more or less the same way. Once once it's in the system, it's treating all content the same way. And so it's not we're not trying to create pro-terrorism view lists. We're just trying to create view lists that people will find engaging and what it, we we just have an engagement algorithm. Right. Well, we have an engagement algorithm that drives up our profits, right? Like, let's be clear, we're trying to get more users to spend more time on our site so we make more money. Um, yes, this was um, something that got a lot of attention from Justice Thomas at the oral argument. He said basically, well, it's the same algorithm that promotes people to like their favorite peel-off sites or to race car drivers. How is this any different? And the answer is, um, let's see if I can do it without stumbling even for myself. So the answer from um, the lawyer for the family who was suing was, right, sure, that's fine. You also have to have an underlying law here that creates some way to sue, right? So like, if Google is promoting pilaf videos, that's not against the law in any way, shape, or form. Whereas promoting ISIS videos, and this is the second case, Twitter versus Tama, um, promoting ISIS videos in the plaintiff's view um, creates liability under anti-terrorism laws in the United States. So it's like a two-step, right? This That's the way these cases interlock. There's this, what you would say, what lawyers call this kind of threshold question. Does Section 230 just grant liability from all these other laws so that internet service providers are not liable, like no matter what kind of content people see? and how it might break some other law? Or do you say, well, in a case where it's possible that the internet service provider um, promoted terrorism in some way, we're going to say it's possible to get past the barrier of Section 230 and get to that question. Emily, before we leave this topic, can you try to explain how this Section 230 case, which will be decided however it is, will have a conversation with, conflict with, engage with the other big looming Section 230 case, which is the challenge to the Florida and Texas laws that basically try to bar Google and Twitter and Facebook from removing content by politicians, by media organizations, or by by people who express uh, extreme political views. So basically, in the second case, Twitter versus Tomna, the, there's another problem about line drawing, right? So like, if you're Twitter, and you're maybe accidentally promoting ISIS videos, but those videos aren't connected to the specific attack that the um, family member who's, um, that whose family is suing was killed in, 
are you liable? Like, does there have to be a specific connection? Do you have to know that the terrorist who pointed the gun and shot saw a video that you promoted? And in this case, there is no evidence of that, as I understand it. It's not a direct connection. I mean, I'm just going to say query why the plaintiffs didn't find a better set of facts to sue under. But anyway, that's where we are. And so then you end up with this potential, like very broad idea of liability. And you're right. The government was trying to find some middle ground. Let's go to cocktail chatter. So when you've been so muddled because you've been talking about Section 230 and you were just completely upside down and you were trying to have something, the only 230 you want is something with 230 proof, which is impossible, kids. Can't get that. Uh, What will you be chattering about, John? I will be chattering about a um, website called um, thekidsshouldseethis.com, which is 788 videos about how things are made. Um, everything from building a drip <gasps> sandcastle to how to fly a basic dart airplane. Um, oh, my gosh. Yeah. It's uh, making brown butter salted caramel donuts. I mean. Do they have quadratini? I'm obsessed with those little wafer cookies and how they're made. And I've been searching the Internet for videos about how quadratini are made. I haven't been able to find them. Um, wow. I, I, I did not. I did not know that. Um no, but they do have how chess pieces are made and Japanese manhole covers. Um, anyway, I mean, you can spend a day enjoying these. I'm obsessed with how stuff is made. My Instagram feed is f- filled with back exercises, guitar instructions, and how various things are extruded through machine piping to create food and strange um, tool and die Uh, It's a very, you can imagine the ads I'm getting served. So I read a post this week by Jill Filipovich on her substack called Fear of a Female Body. And it's about an art exhibit at McAllister um, by an Iranian-American feminist artist that students objected to. Um, It was Muslim students who objected. The university, I would say, like, kind of caved to them. It's just a really interesting... um, Increasingly familiar set of facts about students saying that they're being harmed by art or harmed by content and administrators being... uh, Stay tuned for Slate Plus. Yeah, it's related to Slate Plus, but it's totally its own thing. So Fear of a Female Body by Jill Filipovich on her excellent Substack. My chatter. uh, Reminder, we're doing a CityCast DC Live on Wednesday, March 1st at Politics and Pros Union Market at 6.30. So please join me and and the CityCast DC team if you're in DC. It's going to be really fun. Um, That's not my chatter. My chatter, two chatters actually, both quick. I went to a concert uh, this week, which was really great. I hadn't been to a concert in a while um, with the young people. There were all the young people. It was Morgan Wade, who's this amazing country rock singer. You guys would love Morgan Wade. Check her out. Do you know her? Either of you? No? You got to listen to her. I do because you turned me on to her. I really like her. She's anyway, the concert kicked fucking ass. It was amazing. Uh, but there were all these young people, clumps of young Gen Z women who were around me. And for like a hugely significant part of the show, they were just Instagramming, Snapchatting, doing B reels, it and having their phones up and filming the stage, which is like I could give a fuck what they're doing. Like I don't care. They could have been they could have been cooking soup at the venue for all I care. But it's really disruptive when someone is sticking their phone up in front of you and blocking your sight line every twenty seven seconds. It's like what is wrong with these young people? What is wrong with them? You guys have no answer for what's wrong. There's just something wrong with them. Uh, when I posed this to some of my colleagues at CityCast, they said every generation behaves badly at concerts and our generation behave badly at concerts. We just in some different way. And these kids are not differently and not unusual. Well, wait, uh, that that's a fine assertion, except it needs some support. Like what were we doing at concerts that they weren't doing in the sixties? That's ridiculous. We weren't doing anything different. One of my colleagues said, well, like the way men used concerts to pick up women in disgusting ways, that was very prevalent. Now it's been true since the twenties. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that's not every generation. That's humankind. Every generation would require them to do it differently in the 20s and the 40s and the 60s and the 80s, and yet they didn't. I'm not enough of a concert goer to know how we Gen Xers behave badly at concerts. But all right, Gen Zers are worse. That's the conclusion, that Gen Zers are worse.
listeners, you also have chatters. Uh, I hope maybe we have a Gen Z chatter today from some really smart, wise Gen Zer who videotapes everything that they live with. Um, please tweet your chatter to us at, at SlateGapFest or email us at gapfest at slate.com, something that you would be chattering about at your cocktail party. And our chatter today comes from Dylan O'Leary. Hey, GapFest. This is Dylan O'Leary in London, England. And my chatter this week will be an article that ran in the Financial Times magazine titled After Hours with Ten Foot, London's Most Notorious Graffiti Writer. It is a captivating and fascinating look at Ten Foot, a man who manages to tag every possible place in this city by slipping through its nooks and crannies using keys he's, air quotes, finessed from the London Transport Authorities. In doing so, he's actively risking his life on railway infrastructure while also risking his liberty, trespassing and stealing every can of paint he uses. But this article doesn't simply glorify Ten Foot or graffiti. It also follows the woman tasked with finding him and those like him. In doing so, it offers a complex view of graffiti as art, as crime, and it interrogates its ubiquity in city life. I loved this story because it opened me to a whole subculture I never knew of before, and more than that, it quite literally changed the way I look at my city. I can't go anywhere without seeing 10 foots tag on walls, windows, and bridge panels. And given how prolific he's been in the world, I imagine you're going to start seeing him too. 